Hello, everybody. My name is Peter Jonasson, and I've spent the last 20-something years studying romantic relationships, personality psychology, sexual relationships, and all sorts of things like that. I thought it was time that I created a YouTube channel, and I thought I would start my YouTube channel where I got my start in the research game, something that's near and dear to all of our hearts, I hope, why we choose the romantic partners we choose. And I'm going to put forth to you briefly uh, what will be, for some, an overwhelmingly uh, provocative hypothesis. And that hypothesis is, despite all of the apparent idiosyncrasies, all the apparent particular traits and, you know, uh, uh, fashion or, or tattoos or beards or all the little bitty things that we think of when we, when we study mate preferences, when we think about who we choose, what we choose, when we have this kind of tinderized version of reality for dating where it's about are they tall enough, are they short enough, are they this, are they that. I would like to say that there are only two things that we want in our romantic and our sexual partners. Two things. And I'm going to give you an easy way to remember them. And they're just two S's. One S stands for sexiness, and one S stands for safety. What we want, regardless of all the other apparent noise, traits, controversy, culture to culture, regardless of uh, uh, um, context, like whether you grew up poor or grew up rich or any of this kind of stuff, what we want is not a thing in both cases, it's a feeling. We want someone who makes us feel sexy, someone who makes us feel safe. And that's it. Everything else that we've studied for decades, if not a, if not a century or more, by poets, philosophers, priests, professors, we have studied these things, we have beaten this, de this horse to death. And it's dead. So let's let it die, because what we really want is someone who makes us feel that, mm, that kind of almost hard to describe that tangible chemistry. And we don't want to feel that ick either. We want a particular feeling. All of the traits that lead up to that feeling are what researchers tend to study, because those are easier to understand. But ultimately, we want to feel turned on. We want to feel drawn to that person. A person who's trying too hard might give you the ick, regardless of, of all the good qualities somebody might have. If you don't feel that, that pull towards that person, then it just doesn't go anywhere. You need to feel that, right? Any relationship that lacks that is, is very hard to maintain. And it's hard to feel connected, to feel motivated, to want to do anything, to think, of, to want to think of this person, and all think all sorts of things. So there are only two things that we want in our partners, and it's S and S. So sexiness, whether they're physically attractive or how they smell or how they don't. Right? They, they, there are qualities that might make you reject that person, but you that 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 rejection is a fee is based on a feeling, right? That turns me off, right? Maybe uh, um, beards turn you off if you're a lady, or for men, maybe it's uh, tattoos or uh, other things. We get obsessed with minutia about body count and silliness. It, we, it's not a thing, it's a feeling, okay? The other feeling is safety. So we have this duality going on here. We want to feel it's like that risk, that fire, which is at odds a little bit with the other bit, safety. We want to feel safe. With, this is both men and women. Now, women tend to want safety more, of course, but than, than men do. Uh, but men want to feel safe. They don't want a woman who is high drama. They don't want a woman who's likely to cheat on them. And we know, and we know all of this stuff already. Right? So the amount of research on this topic is one of the most voluminous in all of social and personality psychology. I am, of course, an evolutionary psychologist, which is a paradigm that tries to understand mate preferences and, and other things um, as a human being, uh, as part of the animal kingdom. And so chimpanzees or dogs don't, you know, itemize a list of mates 
uh, make traits like we, we, we do in our research studies or even how we do in Tinder now and other dating apps where it's there's this laundry list of the checklist approach to dating. This is a, not only is the checklist approach a pathology, it's likely to not lead to anything positive in your life. Um, it doesn't reflect reality because someone can have all the qualities you want and if they don't make you feel, for example, safe, you might then reject them. Now, uh, for, for example, for a woman, if she feels that sexiness and just enough safety or enough safety to make her think that it's okay to go home with this guy, that he's not likely to be a psychopath, um, then it, it might be enough. But safety, feeling safe is often at odds with feeling sexy. Indeed, in relationships, safety is like the death now of sex appeal, right? Of that, of that, well, he, he makes me feel so safe, but know what happens? Then the guy ends up in the friend zone. He just makes you feel safe. You have men, all these pickup artists and all this stuff, all their, the advice they're giving you is what they're trying to do is maintain that tension, right? That, that spark, that fire to not let it go out, to not let it get boring. Now, what serves these two dimensions, sex and safety? I mean, in principle, there are, there's an infinite number. And researchers tend to do uh, just that, study an infinite number, like a number that they just make up. 17 traits, 20 traits, 50 traits, whatever it is. Five traits. But these are kind of chosen in a mildly ad hoc and a little bit convenient uh, way. And so I'd like to propose to you not only uh, that there are only two things that we, we want, right? That there is, we want to feel safe and we want to feel sexy, but the things that serve those needs, the, the actual things, the qualities in, in the person, in the relationship dynamic that, that, what we, that, that serve those two S's are only, are only four things. So you can, you, if you look at the literature, you would think that there are hundreds of things that we care about. But they don't, they don't reduce, they have to reduce to something more essential. Um, we, we don't have such random idiosyncratic mate preferences. There are, there are patterns that, that we should be able to intuit, but if we're so caught up in looking at the trees, we miss the forest. So I put forth to you that there are only four things, four traits, that we use to get the feeling of, that serve the feelings of sexiness and safety. The first one is physicality. Physicality encompasses attractiveness, how the person looks, smells, facial symmetry, waist to hip ratio. The traits on this list just go on and on and on. And we know all about them. And they're not, and they're not only the positive versions, they're sometimes the negative versions. So disgust mechanisms ha um, having been activated in the presence of things like a bad odor, will um, reduce the feeling of sexiness and the feeling of safety, and then the relationship is over, right? So a person who smells is likely to carry pathogens or ancestrally was likely to carry pathogens, or is more likely at least to carry pathogens than someone smells not, that, that, that smells nice. And they, it decreases sexual attraction because you're, you've got this grossed out, you, you can't get close to the person. If you can't get close to the person, then there's no go, right? There's no sex. Um, and that's a lot of what the sexiness S is about, is drawing you close to that person. You must merge your souls. No, of course not. You must merge your bodies with that person. So you have physicality. Then you have the three C's, C cubed. So I like to call this model PC cubed. And the first one is compassion. Compassion is a safety trait. This person makes me feel uh, like they're not gonna hurt me. They're kind. For example, they're generous. For another example, maybe they're uh, uh, um, uh, they care for a, a dog. For example, so if people who have dogs. This is a very cute, idiosyncratic kind of trait. Oh, he has a dog. He's such a nice guy. Well, what what the hell does that mean? He has a dog. We could study the having a dog bit to a blue in the face, but it's a but it's a theoretical dead end. What matters is the bigger picture. The bigger picture is that having a dog signals that this person, is, this, this man, is, uh, is willing to invest, is a caring person. And if he cares for a dog, he's likely to care for me, and he's likely to also care for our potential offspring. The next C is competence. Competence is my favorite trait, mostly because I prioritize my, 
my displays of competence over other displays of compassion. And maybe that's a mistake that I make in my life, something I've thought about. So competence might be seen in fashion, wine, uh, being a wine connoisseur, wine snob or something. Um, but it's the ability to get access to resources, education, money, uh, uh, social status. All these things are traits of competence, right? And they signal this person could invest in me and their offspring. Because And both men want partners, both men and women want partners who, who can invest in them. Not just who are willing, which is the former, but who can do it, right? They have, they have monetary resources. They have temporal resources. So if you have no time, right? So this is one of the troubles of being, say, say poor, is that you're you have less time on your hands to do things like dating. Um, uh, and if you have less money, you also you signal a different level of competence to the world. Okay, so competence is likely to serve um, both a little bit of sexy and a little bit of and, and a little bit of safety, in my opinion. Right, and this is what our initial research is at least showing uh, to be the case. So, men and women want competent partners. Women tend to want them more. Okay. Um, and the last one is compatibility. Compatibility is not very well studied, if I'm honest. Um, and that's because it's hard to work out the dynamics. Compatibility is a dynamic system. It's about how two people fit together. And most research on mate preferences, mate choice, tends to be like a little bit abstract. Like, here is this partner. I'm going to describe them in all these ways. You know, this person is, you know, has a, a good job but is short, for example. Right? And shortness, for example, might and, and, and physicality um, um, play into these things. And, in, and these traits interact, of course, of course. Um, but compatibility is a harder one. It's a slippier one because the other things are about qualities in the other person that you choose. But the compatibility one is about how we work together. And compatibility might actually be the most important thing of all in terms of mate choice, actually. And highly, highly, highly above all of the things valued in women than other traits, for example. But, but men as well. You need sexual compatibility. You need romantic compatibility. You need lifestyle compatibility. Like something like chronotype could actually be a compatibility marker. If I'm up at 8, 9 in the morning on a Saturday going to the gym and you're sleeping until 1 in the afternoon, well, you've, you've lost half of the day that I've already been up, you know, living. And so it's a, even something like chronotype might actually be a compatibility issue. But it has not been well studied. But the ability to coordinate a household, to coordinate child rearing, is uh, not just likely to be a fundamental evolutionary need, but a fundamental uh, social need. Getting along with other people, right? Having a, being a team is, is, is super important. And so a, a compatibility is probably a safety trait. A partner who you are, compatible with is more likely to invest in you because it's rare, right? We, we act because of the Tinder world like mates are just everywhere. Now, attractive people are everywhere. People may be willing to have sex, especially in the case of men, because men are much more willing to have sex than women, uh, and therefore willing to go on dates, willing to pursue, uh, men are. So there's the illusion of free choice, but that's not reasonable. Finding a compatible partner is probably the hardest thing you can do because, especially as you get older, you develop all sorts of ticks, right? I like this this way, I like this that way. And it's not just ticks in your life, it's even ticks sexually, things that, specific things that you want. And so compatibility is uh, understudied, but is probably the most fundamental safety trait. Um, and so in, the, in, in closing, um, I think researchers have spent Lots of time, lots of paper, telling us lots of stuff about mate choice, mate preferences. One of the questions that we all struggle with. Why does this person not love me? Why, do I, why am I attracted to these men and not those men? I want to date these men, but I keep going after these men. Understanding this, if you could boil it down to something tangible like safety and sex, and these four kind of basic traits, these basic categories of traits, it, it might actually not just help researchers, but it might help people better understand why they're in the predicament they're in, how they could maybe change their behavior. 
I hope researchers will pick up this idea, but I suspect that it's a little bit underwhelming for them because they've spent so many years studying their pet variable, like a, you know, playing the guitar or something like that. As interesting as that might be, I think that's a theoretical dead end and the research is not going to go very far. But if you can work out what are the, um, the fundamental features that people look for in their partners, then you can start doing experiments where you say, okay, now people want a competent partner, but what are the conditions that make this go up or down? Right? Maybe if you grew up in a difficult environment, you may prioritize competence, especially if you're a woman. Uh, maybe if you grew up in an environment that was full of pathogens, you might you might desire a partner or choose a partner more based on their physicality. You might even be willing to sacrifice things like compassion to get these other things that you want. This is both in men and women and all over the world. And so I'm trying to do this research now. It's not going as quickly as I would like, to, like it to because I'm kind of in the, in my mind, semi-retired. Uh, but hopefully this, this video will inspire researchers to say, okay, Let's see if we can do something with this idea. Like we, we know Peter Jonasson, we know his work, um, and we like or don't like his ideas, but let's see what we can do with this because then researchers would have the same terms. We could all talk about the same things as researchers, and therefore we might actually make some meaningful progress. This is one of those fields that doesn't make any progress in part because we're using different terms, but also because they're, the sides are so theoretically entrenched that we don't really get anywhere. So that's called the sociocultural slash feminist side of the equation. And the evolution psychologists don't do a very good job at communicating with one another, let alone, let alone coordinating research together. And so maybe if we could say, okay, look, here are the, here's a finite list of traits that has good uh, theoretical and even just sensible reasons to, to examine them. Now we can start building a body of literature, testing things that might actually reveal uh, um, some fundamental truths about something that is probably the most important decision you'll ever make in your life, choosing who to love. Bye. Oh yeah, like and subscribe and tell your friends. Hopefully we'll make this a fun channel and if you have any um, topics you want, to, want me to talk about, you let me know.